Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to thank the Morris family, uh, for starters, for the support they've given to the Center for Law and Liberty. In particular, I thank Dr. Stuart Morris, seated in front here, for his many labors on behalf of HBU uh, and his generosity toward the university for really the entire history of its existence. Tonight, I'll discuss James Iredell as a forgotten founder, but Dr. Morris is an HBU founder, founding father right here in this room, and he will not be forgotten. I want to thank Dr. Chris Hammonds, uh, who is, as he mentioned, the director of the, the Morris Family Center for Law and Liberty, and he's the, the mastermind behind these series and invited me to speak, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let me get my slides going here. I gotta figure out what's up. There we go. So James Iredell, who's that? Never heard of him. Can't be important. Um, you know, as Dr. Hammonds mentioned, I uh, worked on a project uh, dealing with the early history of the Supreme Court. We published the historical sources generated by the court in its first 10 years of existence, so basically the 1790s. And uh, that's where I met James Iredell. So uh, I have a long association with him. I, I worked in that position many years ago. But everyone who has studied the early history of the Supreme Court knows James Iredell. And I, I hope to sort of give some reasons why as we go forward. Um, but for starters, he was from North Carolina. He was a lawyer, obviously, a judge, a family man. During the American Revolution, he was a patriot. During the debate over the ratification of the Constitution, he was a Federalist. He took the position of supporting the Constitution, seeking its approval. And finally, he became a Justice of the United States Supreme Court in the first decade of its existence. His life's work really shows a great love for the law, and to me, that's really what stands out about him. Um, while he lived, many considered him to be one of the finest legal minds of the whole revolutionary era. So why haven't we heard of him? Well, I think one reason is that uh, Iredell died in his professional prime in 1799 at the age of 48 after just nine years on the Supreme Court. Had he lived, it seems very likely that he would have become Chief Justice when that position opened up in 1800. The man who did become Chief Justice at that point uh, was John Marshall, and John Marshall is super famous. Um, John Marshall served as Chief Justice for, eight, for, for 35 years, and he saw a lot go down. Um, and so his, he's associated with many important uh, developments in American law and politics. Um, as I said, Iredell passed away in 1799 and, you know, missed that train. Um, but he's not a founding father, in my view, for what he could have accomplished had he lived longer. Iredell is a founder for what he did accomplish while he lived. He served North Carolina during the Revolutionary War, secured North Carolina's ratification of the U.S. Constitution, and he really brought a priceless knowledge and respect for law to the Supreme Court in its earliest formative years, those first 10 years of the Supreme Court's existence. So that's, that's in brief, my case for him as a founding father. You know, we could probably spend all night uh, defining what a founding father is and who makes the list, who makes the cut, who doesn't. Um, but that's my brief case. I don't want to sort of go into that unless you guys would like to do it during the question and answer period. But that's my brief case for James Iredell, someone I would consider a, a kind of a second tier founding father in the sense that he, he didn't become a president, um, but he's very active uh, through this whole course of, of the early history of our country. But for all of that, I, I want to speak first uh, of one thing about James Iredell, um, and that is, that's a little bit different, and that is the fact that he was a migrant. He was born in England, not in America, in 1751. He was the oldest of five children. Uh, his father was a merchant, but his father suffered a stroke when James was just 15 years old. 
And after that, his father uh, really was not capable of supporting the family financially. Two years after that, in 1768, a well-connected relative managed to get Iredell a position as a customs collector in North Carolina. So he's, he's living in England, he's born and raised in England, but now a family connection has gotten him a, a job in the colony of North Carolina. Like most positions in the British government at this time, the job was overpaid. The work was light and it allowed time for other pursuits. So, and we'll get, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so off James goes at the tender age of 17, off to America to assume his new position uh, in the town of Edenton, North Carolina. As the oldest son, he carried his family's hopes with him. In fact, his family needed his earnings and a large portion of those earnings uh, he sent back to England to support his, his uh, parents and his siblings. As with many immigrant families today, Iredell's move to America drew other family members to America. In 1784, his brother Tom moved in with him and uh, Iredell's family at that point. In 1790, Iredell's mother came to America as well. They were still kin back in England, of course, and so the Iredells continued to be a transatlantic family. Strains continued on both sides of the Atlantic. Tom, coming to North Carolina, made a good start studying law in Edenton, but eventually illness and a certain lack of stick to made Tom a long-term dependent on big brother James. As for Iredell's mother, James certainly loved her. There's an affectionate correspondence between the two of them when she was still in England. He certainly loved her and he welcomed her arrival in America. It's something that he had hoped for for a long time. But when she came, he discovered something about her that had not been revealed in anybody's letters. And that is that she was an alcoholic. A fact that James's brother Arthur, an Anglican clergyman in England, had, had all too conveniently neglected to reveal to James in their correspondence. So I mentioned this, you know, that to, to emphasize that in crossing the Atlantic, James Iredell really had become the repository of the aspirations of a family that was really in, in difficult circumstances. And he also became its, its uh, expected emotional and financial backbone. That uh, may sound like a lot to put on the shoulders of a 17-year-old. Um, he had to mature quickly, and it looks like he did mature quickly. And it looks even like the burdens placed on him may have been what spurred him to achieve uh, some pretty remarkable things in America. It looks to me like he was a striver. Uh, today we would say he had grit. Um, when he got to North Carolina, he took his post as a customs collector, which is a type of, of tax, he's a tax collector. Not, not an ideal job uh, at a time when American protests against taxation are, are rising, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so he takes his post, but he also starts studying law under a mentor, a man named Samuel Johnston. Um, and Johnston became not only Iredell's friend and law teacher, but a really close friend, a patron, as it were, and eventually uh, Iredell's brother-in-law, because James is going to marry Johnston's younger sister. So, you know, James comes in 1768, he starts studying law, and then almost, you know, presto, in 1770, two years later, um, James Iredell was admitted to practice law, uh, admitted to the North Carolina bar. It was a lot easier to become a lawyer in the 1700s and the 1800s. This is a photo on the right of a bar exam, you know, probably from the 1980s or so. Uh, you know, that's part of the process to become a lawyer today. Back in the 1700s and 1800s, you studied a little bit of law, you went before a judge, the judge, the judge might ask you a few questions, you have, a, you have another lawyer there to sponsor you, and you're probably in. Right? So, so James Iredell, he's 19 years old and, you know, presto, he's a lawyer. It saves a lot on tuition. Um, 
But on the other hand, lawyering was difficult work. It involved a lot of traveling from county to county. Um, if you really wanted to do it seriously, county to county, court to court, presenting your client's cases. It's not known how much lawyering Iredell did while he was still a customs collector. He said in one of his letters that he attended some, some county courts, but that he actually lost money doing so because of the expense of travel and accommodations. So it, it doesn't look like he was making much money at it, and the money he was making at his, his day job, as it were, uh, a lot of that was going back to England. He did become deeply knowledgeable of the law, um, and in the revolutionary era, I think someone like James Iredell was really one kind of the right person at the right time. The time called for political wisdom, it called for personal sacrifice, and I think Iredell gave to the revolution both of these things. He, he got the wisdom from his, his serious study of the law, and he got the sacrifice that the revolution called for from the way he had sacrificed for his family. So he was kind of already developing in a direction that would make him a very valuable person in, in the revolutionary era. So well, let, let's say a little bit about the revolutionary era. Uh, so uh, uh, Iredell arrives in 1768. The, the colonies are already in conflict with Britain. Iredell's in a difficult spot. He was a newcomer who needed to fit in in Carolina, but he was also a British government official who had taken an oath of allegiance to the British government. And of course, he was very young. Iredell became active in writing and speaking against the measures of parliament that uh, the colonists were opposing. And you know, so far as it went, there was, no, there was no real problem with that in terms of his oath of allegiance. Right? You, could, you could object to laws passed by a government to which you had made an oath of allegiance without compromising your oath or going back on it. Can't you? I don't know how many of you have taken oaths. <laughs> this is not something we do today. You know, a sacred vow to remain loyal to a person or an institution. You know, this is what Iredell had done but he didn't see criticizing Parliament as a violation of, of that oath. Um, and as events began to lead to a sharp, violent conflict between the colonies and the British government, um, Iredell was kind of slow to go on board. He didn't abandon his formal support for British rule until things reached a point where Iredell believed that British authority had collapsed in the colonies and that his oath, in a sense, had expired as a result. There was, in his view, sort of nothing more to, to have allegiance to. British rule had collapsed. Um, this was an effective way one could reason one's way through the ethical tangle that the American conflict with Parliament had created. But to Iredell's uncle back in England, Thomas Iredell, Iredell's reasoning was shameful hair-splitting, and Uncle Thomas's view ended up being a very important thing in, in James Iredell's life because James was in line to inherit Uncle Thomas's sizable estate. But Thomas Iredell was so disaffected by James's support of the American cause that he chose James's brother, Arthur, instead as his heir. Now, as I mentioned, Arthur was an Anglican clergyman. Uh, he lived in England. As it became clear that this looked like what was going to happen, uh, James and Arthur exchanged letters, and, and Arthur, Arthur uh, assured James that the uncle's estate would ultimately set up both Arthur and James in comfort. One of my first and most grateful objects will be to add to your ease and independence, Arthur assured James. The inheritance would render, quote, not only myself, but you and all my family comfortable at the least. But Arthur's mikasa es su casa promise of financial generosity never materialized. 
the estate was never shared in any meaningful way between Arthur and any other members of the family. So, you know, James Iredell had taken a position in the Revolutionary War that stripped him of, of uh, an important source of, of financial security. And in fact, Iredell never really prospered. Um, he married Hannah Johnston, James Johnston's uh, younger sister in 1773. That's a portrait of her in old age. That's the only one we have. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that he was really in love with her. I mean, the way he describes her in his letters. Um, just super affectionate. And, and that kind of really continued throughout their marriage. It wasn't sort of an engagement only kind of thing. Um, so he married Hannah in 1773. So she's the younger sister of Samuel Johnston. Samuel Johnston is a very well-connected mentor. But social connections did not automatically translate into wealth. Iredell had borrowed heavily when he first came to North Carolina, and his salary just barely covered his expenses. He did become a landowner, and I'm not really sure exactly why or how. It's very possible that he acquired land through his marriage to Hannah. And at one point, he had more than 4,000 acres. But, and here's a strange thing, and it, it, it may be hard to believe, and it may be hard to believe because it may not be exactly true. <laughs> a lot more, I, I wasn't able to find really enough research to, to demonstrate this, but uh, I think what happened is that he, he did own a lot of land, but the land was not in cultivation, so it didn't bring any income, or very little. And in fact, in the 1780s, Iredell's total acreage kept dropping as he sold off portions of these holdings. So by the late 1780s, he's gone from 4,200 acres to 1,800 acres. You may think, well, he still owns almost 2,000 acres, but it depends on where they are and what's being done with them. I mean, you have to, you have to get someone to, to cultivate the land for it to be income generating. Iredell also owned 14 slaves at some point, at one point. Um, six of them of working age, typically. We know he emancipated at least three of them. They don't appear to have been field slaves. Several of them often accompanied him on his many, many travels as a lawyer and a judge. As with his lands, it doesn't look like Iredell's slaveholding generated significant income for him. And he, he doesn't appear to have been a careful keeper of his own accounts. At any point in time, Iredell couldn't really determine, if you asked him, he wouldn't be able to tell you uh, how much he owed other people or how much others owed him. And, you know, that, that's an element of prosperity, you know, sort of a, a, a proper money, money management, kind of always knowing where, the, where the, the money is. His wife, Hannah, was probably better with money, and she urged him to keep close track of his expenses on the road. But the basic truth appears to be this, that Iredell did not become wealthy as a lawyer or in any public office that he held. At the time of his death, uh, his home in Edenton, you see it on the right, was in disrepair. And it's, it's, it's almost a, a bitter misnomer that this home is called the James Iredell House. Uh, I mean, it looks pretty nice, but it was all built after his death. We don't, we don't really have anything left of the house that he really had when he was living. Um, Samuel Johnston, who probably knew Iredell best, said, he was guilty of no vicious excesses, and his wife is remarkable for her frugality and economy. Yet at the end of each quarter, his purse was empty. Now, you might, may not feel much sympathy for a man who owned 2,000 acres and at least at one point 14 slaves. And I, I'm not asking you to feel sympathy. But I, I do want to point out that Iredell's financial situation contributed a lot to defining what he did and what he did not do as a founding father. Lawyering did not generate the income he often expected, but he frequently felt compelled for financial reasons to prefer it to public service. For example, um, when the war started, Iredell actually helped write the bill that set up the state of North Carolina's courts. 
and he was promptly named um, one of the three judges of the state's Supreme Court. He was, he was only 26 years old. But he only served one term because those judges would have to travel from town to town hearing cases. It was too much work for too little pay, and so he resigned. Then he became attorney general. I'm not sure why. The very next year, he became attorney general in North Carolina, but it required the same travel. So he, he did that for a couple of years, and then he resigned that as well. He tried to resign at points where the revolutionary cause was, was going well, so people wouldn't accuse him of bailing out. But he, 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 did, he felt like he had, he had, to, he had to quit these, these pretty significant positions. Um, and even serving in the state legislature, same kind of problem. He, 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 he declined to, to be a candidate for, for legislative office on several occasions because he had clients and pending cases and those could not be disrupted. Iredell seems to have passed through his financial difficulties without a lot of bitterness or resentment or even embarrassment uh, I am not ashamed of confessing my poverty, he once wrote, as it has not arisen from any dishonorable cause. So, kind of a financial struggle that's, that's shaping what he does in a public way and, and sometimes what he does not do. Um, so, the revolution is won by the Americans. Um, late 1780s, the movement for a new constitution uh, heats up. A constitutional convention meets in Philadelphia. Iredell does not attend, probably for financial reasons. But when that constitution comes out of Philly, he is a super ardent promoter of it because, as you will recall, each state was charged with calling a ratifying convention to decide whether to approve the constitution or not. And so Iredell does become involved in that. He's a delegate to North Carolina's ratifying convention. And um, really leads the supporters of the, of the convention in the, the Constitution in that debate. He leads the Federalist side in North Carolina. And it's an uphill climb because the majority of the delegates to that convention were anti-Federalist. That is, they opposed approval of the Constitution. And they were so opposed that when the convention met, they said, let's just vote right now. <laughs> let's not even discuss it. <laughs> so it took all of Iredell's energies to get the convention to actually debate the Constitution before coming to a vote. Um, and so Iredell says a lot in the debates. He's very active. Um, you know, the Federalists were very concerned about the abuse of power, corruption, that the Constitution would give the national government so much power that it would really annihilate the power of the states. And Iredell's point that he, he returned to over and over again was uh, all power can be abused. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have the power, right? If it's, if it's necessary for the operation of government, you have to have the power. At one point he said, uh, you know, the Constitution can't be responsible for, quote, ensuring the future virtues of all with whom its powers may be entrusted. That kind of talk infuriated the anti-federalists. They wanted a system that in a sense was foolproof, corruption proof, that no matter who you stuck into the system, the system would, allow, would not allow them to do wrong. And Iredell was just flatly saying that that's not possible. The biggest objection the anti-federalist had was that there was no Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And Iredell said, there's no Bill of Rights because this is a document that states the powers that will be granted to the national government. Anything that's not stated there is not granted, it's retained by the people. He compared the Constitution to a power of attorney. When one person gives another person power of attorney, that grant is limited to the power explicitly stated in the document. If I give you power of attorney to sell my lands in Sugar Land, I do not also have to state in the document that you may not sell my lands in the Woodlands, Conroe, and Katy. Yes, I, I do own a lot of property for this. 
<laughs> for the purpose of this scenario. It's understood that I retain the right to sell my lands in those three places because I have not expressly granted you that right in the document. So for Iredale, the Constitution was the same thing, right? It granted rights, granted powers to government, but the only powers that government had were the ones that were expressly granted. Everything else was left with the people. So arguments like that didn't persuade the anti-federalist. In the end, after days of debate, um, the North Carolina Convention rejected the Constitution by a large margin. Now this was after 10 states had already approved the Constitution. So North Carolina's decision put it in an awkward position. The Constitution goes into operation, the United States government is set up, Congress begins to meet, President Washington is elected, inaugurated, begins to serve as president, starts appointing judges, starts appointing you know, other officials. Um, so everything's in operation. North Carolina is not part of it. It's, it's not in the union anymore. It's a foreign nation. Ayrda believed that that situation could not persist, and in fact, he proved right. The new Congress uh, introduced a Bill of Rights that satisfied a lot of anti-federalists in North Carolina. They had a second ratifying convention and they finally approved the Constitution. And so North Carolina came back into the Union. So throughout this whole ratification debate, Iredell had played a leading role and he had demonstrated a, a level of understanding of the issues that I think was really comparable to what any of the other Federalists understood whose words are much better known. You know, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison. And soon other political leaders in the country found out because Iredell and another Federalist uh, financed the publication of the debates of the ratifying convention. Maybe Iredell did this partly to toot his own horn because his speeches were all found throughout those debates. I don't know, it would be an expensive horn um, to say I'm gonna, I'm gonna publish a book because I'm quoted in it. Uh, I'm gonna do this at my own expense. I'm not sure any, who's gonna buy it, but it's possible. But certainly the publication was read by Federalists across the nation and Iredell's important role in getting this very stubborn state of North Carolina into the union became evident across the nation. And it became evident uh, especially to that guy on the left. Washington had appointed, had nominated six men to serve on the Supreme Court. There were six positions when it was first created. One of the six declined the nomination. So there was an opening in 1790. And doggone it that Samuel Johnston who was now a senator, a U.S. senator, he, he caught President Washington's ear and told him about this great guy back in North Carolina, James Iredell. Iredell hadn't been promoting his own cause, uh, but Johnston did. Iredell really benefited from the late entry of North Carolina into the Union because up to this point, no one from North Carolina had been appointed to any federal office because North Carolina up to this point wasn't part of the United States. So it was, the timing just worked out really well for Iredell. Um, now that North Carolina had joined, Washington found Iredell valuable as an appointee from, as Washington put it, a state of some importance in the Union that had yet to provide a single federal official. To be sure, Washington also cited Iredell's abilities, his legal knowledge, and his good character. But Iredell stood out as a strong Federalist who had defended the Federalist cause, defended the Constitution in a difficult state that now finally had come on board. So there you go. Washington nominates Iredell to the United States Supreme Court, and he fills that vacancy. The capital of the United States in the 1790s was Philadelphia. In 1800, it would move to the new, new town of Washington, D.C., but in the 1790s, it was Philadelphia. The court met in a, a courtroom in the, the Philadelphia State House, which we now know as Independence Hall, and it looked something like this image on the right. Um, I mean, that is the courtroom. 
That is the Supreme Court courtroom. You know, renovate it. Uh, but you can see the six justices' seats. I don't know if the, the chief justice really had a chair taller than the others. So that's where the court met when James Iredell was a Supreme Court justice. Uh, what kind of justice was he? He was very thorough, very diligent. He leaned in favor of federal power um, as he had during the ratification debates. But I would say his strongest leaning was in favor of the law. The law as it stood, uh, whatever it said and wherever it said it, in the Constitution, in a statute, in the English common law, in customary legal practice. So he had, he had, a, he had a great respect for, for the sources of law. Um, this was someone who really loved the law. He loved studying it, discussing it. You know, a lot of you perhaps are going to end, going, end up going to law school. Um, and kind of, you know, look at Iredell's life and, and think about law in that way. Loved studying it, discussing it, using it to make cases as a lawyer, to decide cases as a judge. We don't know this from his many letters uh, to family and friends. He wasn't in the habit of quoting legal treatises in his many affectionate letters to his wife, Hannah. But we do know it partly from all the writing he did on law. I don't know how he managed to do it, where he found the time. But he wrote many, many, many pages of treatises that were never published on different areas of law. You know, I have a couple of these up. So this is, this is a treatise he did on the common law. The common law is the basic legal system in England that America inherited. Um, you know, pretty long, that's page 300. Uh, that's his handwriting. And it goes to 500. About time to wrap it up, Jimmy. Probably not more that you can say about the common law than what you can say in 500 pages. But no, page 800. <laughs> and wait, no, <laughs> page 1,000. <laughs> try me, all right, try me. <laughs> no, it actually went to about 1,200 pages. I, you know, I, I am the editor of James Iredell's legal papers. I have been for many years, and this is partly why. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Um, I think that it does go to about 1,200 pages. I think I got tired of photocopying these things off microfilm, and so that's, that's sort of the last even-numbered page I have for you. Uh, he did a couple of other treatises, a couple hundred pages each, you know, all told, probably about 2,000 manuscript pages of, of writing about law. I don't think you can find any early American Supreme Court justice with that. You don't really start seeing that until the 1820s, 1830s. There's just this zeal for the law that Iredell had. Um, none of these were ever published. I think, again, because he died, and sometimes it just it takes a living author to get an author's work published. Um, so they're all still in manuscript form. The other thing that's noteworthy about Iredell is he took a lot of notes. And you might think that's kind of a silly uh, trait to, to offer up. Um, but at this time, Supreme Court justices, they were not given written briefs by lawyers presenting cases before them. Basically, a date would be set for oral argument for both sides to, to verbally make their case. The lawyers would show up and they would deliver their oral arguments. It was up to the Supreme Court justice to absorb what the lawyers were saying. I know this may sound like your professors, you know. I, <laughs> you just got to write it down, all right? Uh, it was up to the justice to absorb what the lawyers were saying and to make his own record of it as he saw fit. You know, so just as in a class you take at, you students take at HBU, you know, some students may have a lot of notes from the class session. Other students may have a few lines and a, a couple of doodles. It was, it was kind of like that in the Supreme Court as well. And so you know, I, I don't, I don't make, want to make anyone who doodles uncomfortable, but in the long run, I think it's probably, you know, the student who's taken a lot of notes, they, maybe they have actually sort of remembered more of what was said. Maybe, maybe not. But Iredell's certainly the one who takes a lot of notes, showing, you know, that he's very diligent in understanding the, the, the case. A lot of times the, the, the lawyers would cite legal treatises or past cases. 
So you, you take down the note of that case and you, you look it up. You're not going to be spoon-fed a, a printed, you know, 20 page brief by each side that gives you the, the full, full scope of what they've argued. So I mention this not, again, not to praise Iredell for note taking per se, but to suggest that his note taking along with his writing reflect his deep interest in getting the law right. And I think in any era, but especially in a founding era, that quality in a person is invaluable and I'm glad it was present in Iredell in the founding era of our nation. But I'm not telling you anything so far about what his actual views were as a judge. Um, let me give you a taste. It's kind of hard to summarize because you immediately will start, we will immediately start thinking about what label is attached to such views today. But let me just discuss one issue that came before Iredell um, and before the Supreme Court, and that's the, the, the issue of judicial review. Judicial review is the power of a court to determine whether a law is constitutional or not. And if it is not, the power to declare the law void of no effect. Now, Iredell was, in fact, an early adopter of judicial review long before the Supreme Court claimed the power in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803. Decades before that, some American state courts had considered the power of judicial review and even exercised it. And just as there are forgotten founders, there are forgotten cases. In North Carolina, there was a judicial review case called Bayard versus Singleton in 1786. So this is 17 years before Marbury versus Madison. The Constitution hasn't even been approved at this point. So what's, what's going on in North Carolina? The, the legislature had passed a law that prohibited loyalists, that is people, Americans who had remained loyal to the king, from suing debtors who owed them debts. On the other hand, the North Carolina state constitution guaranteed the right to a jury trial in all cases involving property. The provisions seemed to contradict each other. Since a debt claim was clearly a form of property, the North Carolina judges exercised judicial review and they decided that the provision in the Constitution voided the law passed by the legislature. Iredell was not a judge in that case, but he did address judicial review in the press and in private correspondence in the 1780s, and he supported judicial review and he supported the decision that the judges had reached. Iredell believed that legislatures were created by a constitution. Their powers were limited by the constitution. The courts had the right to intervene and declare a law void if it violated the constitution. But what if the constitution did not explicitly grant the power of judicial review to the courts? And wouldn't giving the courts this power subject the people to the will of a few judges and make those judges more powerful than any European monarch ever was? And these are questions raised by uh, someone that Iredell communicated with on this issue. Iredell responded by saying, uh, the exercise of judicial review by courts is unavoidable. When the Constitution and a legislative act are in conflict, a court has no choice but to say, quote, whether they will obey the Constitution or an act inconsistent with it. The exercise of judicial review was unavoidable. The Constitution, this is Iredell's words again, the Constitution not being a mere imaginary thing about which 10,000 different opinions may be formed, but a written document to which all may have recourse and to which therefore the judges cannot willfully blind themselves. Now, although Iredell supported judicial review on principle, uh, he believed it should be exercised with great caution. A law, he said, should be unconstitutional beyond dispute before it is pronounced such by any court. When he became a Supreme Court justice, uh, he continued to support judicial review. There are some cases in the court during these years that involved judicial review. Marbury was not the first. 
Um, I'm, you know, for, for the sake of time, I'm gonna pass over uh, the one that I intended to mention. Iredell was not um, someone who always sided with an increase in judicial power. His decisions reflected uh, a value placed on federalism, on the authority of states, state governments, as well as the federal government, a value placed on judicial review, a value placed on what we now call original intent. What did the framers of the Constitution intend? The Constitution had been, only, had been framed just a few years before, and you know, some people went in other directions and said that, you know, it, the Constitution means what the words might suggest it means. But Iredell kind of, kind of hewed to the line that, you know, when this thing was being ratified back in the late 1780s, this is what people, what people said it thought it meant, that they thought it meant. Let's, let's stick to that. So a respect for, a respect for original intent um, is also part of his judicial philosophy. In short, Iredell was a Federalist who affirmed judicial power, uh, especially with respect to judicial review, but not so far as to seize every available opportunity to expand judicial power. Now, when Iredell became a Supreme Court Justice, he was only 38 years old. Uh, and to this day, he's one of the youngest people ever to be appointed to the High Court. Um, at that time, when he was appointed, he was the father of two small children. A third would be born in 1792. And he had thought that he had finally secured by his appointment the income that his family needed. The annual salary for a Supreme Court justice was $3,500, paid quarterly. But there was no travel allowance. And Hannah, you know, I think she was really a lot more savvy about money than, than James was. You know, Hannah remarked, you know, I think James was pretty excited about making 3500 bucks a year. But Hannah remarked that considering our expenses on the road, the salary was, quote, no great stock of money. And soon it be, became clear that being a Supreme Court justice would indeed require a lot of traveling. The Iredell family moved to Philadelphia uh, to be together for the, the Supreme Court sessions in that city. But Justice Iredell would do a lot more traveling than that. Supreme Court justices were required to serve also as circuit court judges when the Supreme Court was not in session. That meant traveling to and through different parts of the United States from court to court, state to state, typically over bad roads and at great cost and great inconvenience. These were known as the circuits, and you know, there are three of them, eastern, middle, and southern, and you can see they're, oh, they're grouped geographically, right? Eastern is mainly New England, middle is the Mid-Atlantic plus Virginia and Maryland, and then the southern is the Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, in his first circuit, Iredell traveled 1,900 miles going through the southern circuit, which was considered the worst because it had the worst roads and there was the, the greatest distance between the towns. 1,900 miles. All of justices hated it. They begged and pleaded that Congress change the law, create a separate set of judges for these circuit courts so the Supreme Court justices could just stay in Philadelphia. But Congress did not want the additional expense of a new set of judges. And so circuit writing for Supreme Court judges, justices continues throughout the 1800s all the way until 1891, a century later. And of course, long after forgotten founders like James Iredell had passed from the scene. Now, you know, we can, we can kind of laugh uh, a little bit about these judges so high and mighty, you know, exercising judicial review to strike down laws, although they didn't do it very much. Uh, now they have to get on a horse or ride in a rickety horse-drawn carriage hundreds of miles to hear cases. 
But in Iredell's case, particularly, the impact of circuit writing was little short of devastating. There were enjoyable times, to be sure. You know, Iredell met and dined frequently with President Washington and Martha Washington in Philadelphia. Um, there were a lot of nice parties. Iredell would write back to his wife, Hannah, you know, had a, had a very fine party, much dancing, you know, stayed out till 2 a.m. He was a sociable guy. Um, so there were some fun moments, but the, the stress, the bodily stress of this travel. And he was months away from his family because in 1793, Hannah and the kids moved back to North Carolina. It's impossible I can lead this life much longer, he wrote to Hannah in 1796. To lead a life of perfect, perpetual traveling and almost continual absence from home is a very severe lot to be doomed to in the decline of life after incessant attention to business, the preceding part of it. Arda was then 44 years old, an age when many men expect life to be getting easier as reward for their past efforts begins rolling in. As things turned out, it really was impossible that Iredell could lead this life much longer. He got sick. He got very ill. He missed the 1799 sessions of the Supreme Court due to illness. He worked on his treatises in his time off. And he even afterwards pronounced himself entirely recovered. But it was not to be. He did not live to see the year 1800. He died on October 20th, 1799 two months before the death of President Washington. So let me just say a couple things by way of conclusion. You know, you know sometimes I feel like the, the story it tells itself, and I don't want to sort of be heavy-handed in, in the lessons drawn, but looking at Iredell's life makes me think, you know, the founding of a nation is a very costly affair. And costly might be too soft a word. It, it consumes lives, often in war, but, but always in public service. And I think we, we so often mark the accomplishments of the founding fathers that we forget the personal sacrifices they made to, to secure those accomplishments. Maybe if we remembered both the accomplishments and the sacrifice, there wouldn't be any forgotten founders. I see James Iredell as a kind of expert juggler who did as much on behalf of his country as his personal circumstances would reasonably allow, and in fact did, did more than what his personal circumstances would reasonably allow. He brought a powerful mind, which he had developed through intense study, to the challenges of, of defining the law and government in a young nation. Yes, had he lived longer, he would surely be better known but he accomplished enough in the time he had to merit the title that we give him, the title of a founding father. Thank you. <laughs>